Well, welcome. Uh, my name is Bob Mong. I'm the president of UNT Dallas, and it's wonderful having you in this beautiful uh, room, in this beautiful restored law school. Uh, Dallas is not known as a city of uh, historic preservation, uh, but we're glad that uh, uh, we could work with the city of Dallas and the state of Texas uh, to restore this back to its, uh, in general, 1914 look and feel. Uh, as you know, it was the uh, seat of city government from 1914 until 1978 when the city moved over to the uh, <clears throat> famous Iron Pay Building. And this is famous in its own right, and we'll talk a little bit about that tonight. Obviously, it's a Beaux-Arts architectural specimen, which is rare in Texas. Um, but 1963 is what it's best known for. Uh, and the walls do talk. Uh, 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 Dean Epps can, can uh, testify to that. Uh, but we're so glad you're here tonight. Uh, my job is simply to uh, <clears throat> welcome you and to uh, uh, bring on Dean Epps, who will moderate uh, this discussion uh, with Judge Alsop. But I wanted to say something about both of our deans. Our inaugural dean, of course, uh, uh, was also a federal uh, district judge, Royal Ferguson, uh, the perfect, charismatic inaugural dean, still very active, very, still very much a supporter of this law school and of Dean Epps, uh, just a wonderful human being. We're so fortunate to be able to, we did a nationwide search with a search firm who uh, found Dean Epps. And um, uh, Dean Epps, along with a lot of you, uh, helped guide this school uh, to full approval. I got that right, right, Dean? Yes. Uh, so <laughs> I like to say permanent accreditation, but she always pulls me back when I say that. But anyway, why don't we just get going on this? Uh, Dean Epps, uh, uh, Judge also, thank you so much for being here tonight. All right. Well, thank you, President Mong. And we say permanent accreditation when we're speaking words of faith because educational programs are never permanently accredited, but we plan to keep that accreditation full approval forever. So um, just thank you all for being here. And I'm going to just give a brief overview, and I'm looking forward, I've spent some time today with Judge also. Looking forward to just having kind of a casual conversation about the book to let you all at the end have opportunities to ask any questions you may, may have. Um, I believe everyone here, including my prospective students, I'm always interested, and we have admitted students in the house who are lawyers of tomorrow, uh, likely knows that uh, Lee Harvey Oswald is the person believed to have assassinated John F. Kennedy, our president, back in November of 1963 as he rode along in, with his, in his presidential motorcade past the Texas Book Depository, now houses the 6-4 Museum, who is a co-sponsor. We're doing these projects together, which is uh, wonderful. And then Oswald, after killing the president, uh, shot and killed Officer J.D. Tippett, was arrested by Dallas police. He was held in this building initially on the fifth floor. There are still jail cells there that are preserved for historical purposes. And I always say, I'm the only law school dean that has jail cells available. <laughs> so for students and faculty who misbehave, perhaps I can bring those back into operation. But we do have uh, that. Those on the um, fifth floor, he was interrogated in what is now our legal writing center, where the students go and work on legal writing projects. And then he was shot and killed by Jack Ruby right outside this building. And if everyone, you have the opportunity to go on the tour, to me that's the highlight of going through, one of the highlights of going through the exhibit space is you see the actual uh, place where he was shot and killed just a few feet away from us. So there's a lot of history here connected with uh, Lee Harvey Oswald and that whole event. I'm teaching a class right now on the death penalty and the trial of Jack Ruby, that's one of my areas. And that's a trial that actually happened. And I find Judge Alsop's novel very interesting because this is about the trial of Lee 
Harvey Oswald, and it poses some interesting comparisons, which I hope uh, to ask the judge about here as we go through this discussion. But first, uh, Judge Alston, what inspired you to become an off author? You're a legal giant, you know, a judge, federal judge. What inspired you to become an author also? Well, let me just stick with this, uh, this particular book. Uh, on the 50th anniversary, 1963, of 63, which was 10 years ago, uh, 2013, my New Year's resolution was to read about two things for that whole year. One was the Civil Rights Movement. I had already a good collection that I'd already read, and, uh, and I decided to read selected ones of those again. Uh, but the second topic was the Kennedy assassination, which I had not read a lot about. Back in the day, I had re read the Warren Commission report, or enough of it that I uh, then put it to one side. So I was not, uh, 10 years ago, I was not one of these uh, assassination um, experts. I, w I was not, no way I was, uh, but I decided I was going to educate myself and become uh, knowledgeable. So the uh, I got to reading. I read the first thing. I read the Warren Commission report all over again. I said, you know, they did a damn good job. That's a great report. They did a good job. And, but it referred to 26 volumes of evidence. And I said, I'd like to see some of that evidence. So I got our, I'm a judge, I got our library to go and, uh, we actually had it right there on the premises, to dig up the 26 volumes. And after 10 years, I still have those in my office. They're all dog-eared. Uh, but they're, they're 26 volumes, about the size of this book, actually. And it's uh, divided into Q&A, questions and answer, question and answer before the commission, sometimes in a deposition, and also exhibits, like photographs. I could not put it down. I started reading the first volume, second volume. I was totally absorbed in it. And I remind you, I was doing this not to write a book. I was doing this just to learn about it. And then, uh, but halfway through, a phrase jumped off the page. And the phrase was, a bald spot. You say, well, that's crazy, what does that mean? Well, uh, the bald spot. So, I, so the, 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 uh, this was a testimony by someone named Amos Ewins, E-U-I-N-S, African-American. He was about 16 at the time. He was in high school. He was he had been get, got out of school to come down and see the president. Well, he was standing pretty close to the depository, and he saw the third and last shot, the fatal shot, being fired. And so they asked him, well, what did this guy look like that fired the shot? Well, he could not identify quite a number of things, but one thing he could identify, for example, he could not identify the race. He said the light was wrong, but he, he said, uh, he said, there's one thing that stood out. He had a bald spot right here. A bald spot. Now that was his words, his phrase, not the lawyer's phrase. I've spent 50 years of evaluating evidence. It makes a difference whether it's the lawyer asking the question or in using the phrase or it's the witness who says it on their own. Okay, I, at that moment I said, wait a minute. A bald spot. I've seen that somewhere else. Am I taking too long? Okay, all right. I'm almost done. Uh, I said I've seen it somewhere else. So I started going back to the other volumes. Mechanically, I did it. I didn't have it on a computer, and I found it. It was a, uh, a witness named Sylvia Odio. And I, I'm going to tell you her story because it, it is to this day still a mystery. Sylvia Odio was a Cuban refugee, a young woman, 26 years old, and she was living in Dallas, spoke good English, also Spanish. And uh, two months before the assassination, three guys come to her door at the Crestview Apartments here in, in uh, Dallas. And she didn't know any of them. There were three guys. And uh, the, the tall guy introduced himself as a Leopoldo. That was a war name, meaning uh, uh, a fake name, because they didn't go by their real names, to protect the people back in Cuba. So 
So uh, his name was Leopoldo, and, and uh, he had a uh, sidekick named Angelo, and they introduced a Anglo to them, to her, who went by the name Leon Oswald. Now that's important because later on she swears under oath to the Warren Commission that was Lee Harvey Oswald. He, uh, uh, she then uh, uh, turns down their entreaty to do some fundraising, and they leave. I, I'm going to skip over some of the uh, other details. The next day, this guy calls her, Leopoldo, by phone. You know, in those days, everybody was in the phone book. <laughs> Nobody's in the phone book now. But in those days, everybody was in the phone book. So. She picks up the phone and says to Leopoldo, she thought he wants a date, wants a date. Uh, but then he says, uh, well, what do you think of that guy, Leon? I said, I didn't think anything of him. Why should I think anything? And she said, well, what do you think of him? <clears throat> Nothing. And, uh, well, he's a little loco. Loco was the word he used. He said, a little loco. Uh, he was in the Marines, a good shot. And he says, we should have assassinated. The Cubans are gutless and should have assassinated President Kennedy after the Bay of Pigs. Well, this scared her. She says, I don't want to hear talk like that. She terminated the conversation. <coughs> and then uh, two months later, when she hears the news of the assassination, she faints. And then when she wakes up, she sees on the screen Lee Harvey Oswald on the TV. They have arrested him. And she says, that's the guy they brought. So the Warren Commission says, what did Leopoldo look like? She described him tall, actually tall, 165 pounds, uh, and, and he had a bald spot right here. Her words, not the lawyers. I found that to be amazing. And then there was a bartender, I'll give you just one sentence on this, in, in August, Bartender in New Orleans, Havana Bar, Decatur Street. He identified Oswald as having been with a guy, he didn't say bald spot, but he said his hairline was two and a half inches back, back of where it normally would be. So I said uh, to myself, uh, there's a story here. Uh, at the, up to that point, I'd just been reading for my own edification. And I still had no thought that I would write myself a book, but I began to say, there's a curiosity here. And uh, anyway, so it was that curiosity and about four or five others that I said, you know, a good defense, what would be the best defense to the best prosecution? We all know what the best case for the prosecution is, it's laid out in the Warren Commission, but what would be the best defense against that? And I said, you know, I. Now, at this point, I've almost had 50 years in between being a lawyer and a judge. I said, I, I think I've done enough. I've been in the courtroom for 50 years. I can write this book. I'm going to write this book and see if somebody will publish it. So that is, uh, I, to answer your question, that is how I accidentally got onto this uh, idea that there might be a good story to tell here uh, based upon what would be the best defense that Oswald would have had if there had been a trial? Of course, there was not a trial because of the events that happened in this very building. But uh, the, uh, uh, we, in the book, there is chapter two. And chapter two is where Ruby gets almost right to the point where he's able to shoot Oswald and Officer Roy Vaughn stops him. He didn't even get the chance to pull out the gun. So Ruby is not convicted of anything. Ruby goes on to rock out at the Carousel Club along with Little Lynn and all the other strippers. <laughs> all right, so there we go. Such fun. Now, you talked about having read the Warren Report or a great portion of it. How long did it take you to make it through that? Oh, uh, that's a good question. I'm, I'm doing this now for 10 years ago. I'm gonna say three weeks, three weeks to get just through the Warren Commissioner. It's probably 600 pages. It's a long, it's a long document. It would be, it would be two and a half times this. And is that exclusive of the exhibits? Yeah, exclusive of the exhibits. Because I think you mentioned you had read that report earlier in your I had. life, before you even became a lawyer. Correct. I was in uh, 
I was still in college. What inspired you back then? Because I can't imagine being a, a college student and voluntarily reading <laughs> something that's that long that's not connected with the class. I think I still have that thing. It was put out by the New York Times. Uh, it was a uh, thin paper deal with tiny print, which I could not read today, but anyway, <laughs> but back then my eyes were better. And I, I uh, uh, was, uh, yeah, I read it all. I, I thought I, I thought as a, this was in 64. Right. I'm probably, I'm gonna guess it was 64, 65 that I read that. And I thought uh, I should be informed. Ah, you thought you should be informed. Yeah. Back before we could Google things, and just <laughs> look at Wikipedia and all of that, actually true, reading the actual true. document. Most of my life has been no internet. The internet has been a recent diversion, but uh, most of my life has been just uh, books, <clears throat> notepads, a pencil. Okay, the good old days oh, that yeah. some of us remember. Yes. And you also have memories of actually when this, when the assassination yeah. happened and when the um, shooting of Oswald happened. What was the mood like in the country at that time? You know, this will, may surprise some of the uh, younger people. The, the uh, mood in the country at that time was extremely uh, vitriolic. Uh, and, you know, we think of today as being vitriolic, and you can go on Fox News or you can go on CNN, and you, and you, see, you see them going, going at each other. Uh, in Congress, it's, as Mark Twain said, we have the best Congress money can buy, and, and it's, they're just terrible at uh, going at each other. Uh, uh, but that was true. That's been true for a large part of our nation's history. And then, though I will say in the 60s, they did a little bit more cooperative work on some things. But when it came to civil rights, there was vitriolic as could be. And this nation was divided bitterly over starting with the Brown versus Board decision. And then when Kennedy, uh, uh, I remember it, I, I saw the speech on TV myself. In 1962, uh, President Kennedy uh, decided whenever the uh, University of Alabama was peacefully integrated uh, that uh, the nation needed a civil rights law. And against all of his advisors, he sent one up, up to Congress, mm. which became the Civil Rights Act of 64. Uh, it was uh, actually, incidentally, it was, I don't think it would have been passed except that he was assassinated and President Johnson said, let's enact this in his memory. Uh, but uh, so the, the, the mood of the nation was, in, in the South at least, I can testify to that. In Dallas, Texas, I know it was true too here, but in Mississippi it was even worse. The amount of racism, uh, the murders that have took place, the, the uh, vitriol was extreme on the issue of race. And so uh, that, uh, that, that was one of the uh, themes, one of the moods that were sweeping across the country. Now there were others too. Cuba was one, the Cold War was one, the Cuban Missile Crisis was another. Uh, uh, so there were some pretty serious uh, tensions in 1963. Well, before we turn to uh, your novel, and I ask you a few questions about this, after having read the Warren Report and do doing the research that you've done, what is your conclusion, if I can put it that way, about Oswald's involvement in the assassination? Because some question that, and again, if you use that great research tool, <coughs> Google, you'll find all kinds of theories about what happened and who was on the grassy knoll and how many shots and all of that. After reading that, what what is your uh, conclusion? About well, it's, it's reading it's reading the Warren Commission report, all of the evidence that was in those twenty six volumes, some of what was in the Select Committee in the seventies, and then I did read about thirty other books that uh, others had written. Uh, I don't listen. I'm 
any one of you are just as good as me in drawing your own conclusions. So you can read this all and come to your own conclusions. You can go on the internet, subscribe to all the conspiracy theories you want. You, you know, your, your opinion is just as good as mine. But I'll tell you what I believe, and I, you know, at this stage in life, I'm sometimes more confident than I should be. <laughs> I, there is no doubt in my mind that Lee Harvey Oswald fired all three shots. There were only three. There were three shots. They all came from that window in the depository. The first one missed. I'll come back to that in a minute, why it might have missed. The second one hit President Kennedy just below the neck and the upper back. He would have survived that one. And that one went on through and hit uh, Governor Connolly. So that, that was the so-called magic bullet that was in the movie uh, JFK. It wasn't magic, it was a straight line. It was simple geometry. The simplest of simple geometry, a straight line. The third bullet was the fatal bullet. That's the one that, uh, that framed 313 of the Zabruder film and is sickening to watch even today where President Kennedy lost his life. Uh, those were the three shots. There weren't any other, th there were no other, you know, some people say there were four shots. Some people, some people say there was somebody on the Dow Tex building. No, that's, that's just baloney. That is not the way the three shots most people in the Dealey Plaza, the vast majority, heard three shots. Three bullet shells were found at the window. It was Oswald's gun. It was Oswald, his, his pistol, uh, who shot uh, Officer Tippett. Uh, the proof was overwhelming that Oswald was guilty and that he pulled the trigger. Now, having said that, I've spent 50 years, almost, maybe it's 49, uh, evaluating evidence, transcripts, as a lawyer, now 23 years as a judge. And, and I say, any of you could do your own evaluation, so I'm not the only person who can do this, but I feel strongly uh, that, it, that, uh, that no one else pulled those, pulled those triggers. But I do think this, having read uh, that that guy Leopoldo, who was never found again, I do believe he existed. And I believe that Sylvia Odio was entirely credible. And that he had something to do with possibly encouraging Oswald in some way we don't know. They never found that guy Leopoldo again to this day. Uh, so I think maybe Leopoldo or someone encouraged Oswald. Exactly how, I don't know. Now, he wanted very much to get into Cuba. And it could be that, they, that someone held out a ticket to Cuba as a way to, if he were to assassinate. Remember then, uh, President Kennedy had been trying to kill uh, Castro. This is quite clear. This is not something that is conspiracy theory. That, this is all documented. And uh, Castro knew that, because Castro himself made a speech about, about it and how it was a dangerous precedent. So it's, it is conceivable that Castro uh, had people out there trying to do the same thing to President Kennedy. Um, so that is my conclusion as to what actually happened. But in the story, it's a little different. I, what I tried to do was to say, okay, if, if Oswald knew everything that we now know, well, no, it's not even that much. If he knew everything that was in the Warren Commission report, could he, what defense could he have invented, even if it was a total lie, that would have been corroborated by the Warren Commission report? And there's a pretty good defense. Some of my friends who are defense lawyers say there's reasonable doubt. They've read this. They say there's reasonable doubt. And it's pretty good. The, the, uh, the defense admits almost everything. Not everything, but almost everything. And then only disagrees on a few critical points that swing the whole story the other way. 
Now, I will tell you what the answer is, if you, but I don't want you to read the books while well, I Has everybody purchased their book already? Because I'm about to have uh, the judge tell us a little bit about the story, as much as you're comfortable sure. um, disclosing. But first, uh, your experience as a trial lawyer, because part of that, I mean, it's clear in this book that you had that experience from being a trial lawyer and being a judge. How many trials did you did you well, I, and, and, uh, trials that actually went all the way through. I, I think I counted up 17 whenever I was applying to, for this judge. So 17 in 20-something years, it's, only, it's not even one a year, but it's more than most lawyers, mm -hmm. even in, in my day, had. And, and now as a judge, I probably had, I don't know, I'm going to guess between 150 and 180 trials okay. uh, as, as a judge. Uh, uh, most of those jury trials, but not, not unless some of them would have been bench trials. Okay. Well, I'm going to just throw it op open to you. But And actually, a question just came to my mind when you mentioned the jury, because I noticed in your novel, um, the jury's not mentioned. And the whole voir dire and picking of the jury and that part, and then at the end, of course, we know the jury deliberates and they make a decision and all that. Those really aren't, um, they're not there. Not there. And you don't, you don't want that to there. Not there. I actually, in early, I, I went through more than 100 drafts of this. I wanted to get it just, just right. I, uh, but, but when I got to my first draft that I thought was publishable, it was longer than this. And it did have the voir dire of the jury and jury selection. Uh, and then uh, I had to trim it down by about 20%. So a lot of good scenes <laughs> went on the cutting room floor, including all of the stuff with the, and, and, and all the, the even re rendering the verdict. You, you know, at the end, you only learn about the verdict through the epilogue. Uh, you, you, uh, I cut out all of that, I cut out some plots, I cut out some minor characters that we really didn't need. And for those of you who've ever written a book, you know how hard that is to do. You, because by this point, they're your friends, and you love those. You love those scenes, but but I I, uh, I cut them out. Uh, so I that's that's the answer there. Oh, okay. Because otherwise, no publisher's going to want to look at it. Oh. It would only be lawyers like me that found voir dire entertaining. I'm it sure is. It would be it's extremely important. It's extremely important. important. Like that. And you had uh, lawyers. A couple of things are interesting about the legal team is on both sides. To me, as a woman of color, when I did some reading on the Jack Ruby trial, same kind of time frame, but it was very white and very male. Uh, say all white and all male in terms of the lawyers. And you had um, women, a woman on both sides, prosecution and defense, and you had a woman of color involved. Um, what led you to make those kind of choices? Well, all right. Uh, I, uh, it, I mean, first, first Henry Wade, who was a real person, is in the story. He was he was a white guy. Bill <laughs> Alexander was his deputy. He was a white guy, uh, and uh, and then my chief protagonist, uh, who is fictional, Abe Summer, he was a white guy. So to that extent, it's representative of what you're saying, but. Each side had a, uh, a junior lawyer, both women, and on the federal side it was a, a young Hispanic woman. Uh, and this is another part where some scenes had to get cut out, but, but, but what's in the book is she is a uh, daughter of a World War II casualty and uh, and, there, and in Texas history, there is there's a very good story about the Linda Johnson, and, and at the time they wouldn't allow a uh, Hispanic guy who, who died to be buried in Arlington. I, some of you may know this story. And Linda Johnson, it was I think in 1948, he, he raised hell about that, and he got that guy buried in Arlington Cemetery. Uh, so the anyway, but I don't have I, that was what inspired this idea, but uh, uh, Elaine is her name, 
And you might say, well, Elaine, that's not Hispanic. But in that era, there was assimilation. That was the, that was the doctrine, not the doctrine, but uh, people uh, of all minorities gave their children Anglo names. So Elaine is not Elena, but Elaine. And so she uh, becomes a lawyer. And to prove herself, she works twice as hard as anyone else. And she does some very good work in this story. Uh, it involves General Walker and other, other issues, the Miranda issue. Um, so she, uh, but I realized when, when in, in that this would have been out of character for that time. And I wrestled with that myself and said, no, I think it's a better story if we have these two women in it, and mainly Elaine. The, the, other, the other woman has a, a, a few important scenes, but she, Elaine is the main female character. Now, Sarah Hughes, district judge, she's real. She, she was, uh, and the reason Elaine gets the job is because Sarah Hughes tells she didn't want to be the only woman in the courthouse. And, uh, there was over at the post office, and at the post office, she was the only woman lawyer. She was a judge. She wanted another woman in there, so she put pressure on Barefoot Sanders to hire a woman. So that's how Elaine got the job. And so you have a mixture of the real names and real people who are involved doing things that they didn't really do because this is a novel, but they're still connecting with Texas history, Barefoot Sanders, Sarah to use, um, all very interesting. And also just the, 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 the whole issue of uh, Percy Foreman, who was another Texas legal giant who uh, ends up being the lawyer representing Oswald, who has this dilemma about how to deal with a uh, witness, is African American, who he's going to call, and how to deal with that in an environment where basically the courthouse had been segregated up until the time this trial began, and they mixed everything up. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah. Yeah, this was another hard one to write because I have no doubt it would have been a real issue at the time. Well, first, Percy Foreman, uh, those of you who uh, are about my age or within 10 years will remember Percy, he was a tremendous lawyer from Houston. He tried cases all over Texas, all over the United States, not all over, but uh, he wound up representing the guy who uh, killed Martin Luther King, uh, James Earl, I forgot his name now. Uh, Ray, I believe, uh, and he was a uh, famous death penalty murder case lawyer in Texas. And on the Saturday, the day before Oswald was killed in this building, I have to say because I'm, it's amazing to me to be here, uh, Percy Foreman put out a statement to the press to this effect. He said, if anyone ever needed me as their lawyer, it's Lee Harvey Oswald. <laughs> the next day Oswald was killed. But in my story, Oswald lives. He's not, Oswald never even knows that Ruby was gonna happen, try to kill him. And so uh, Percy Foreman gets the job. Okay, now going to that other scene, now we're in the middle of the trial, and uh, it's the trial, t the defense team is Percy and Karen, young graduate from the University of Texas. I would have had your school in there <laughs> if it had existed then. Well, you, you didn't exist then. So, uh, he says to, uh, and uh, Amos Ewens is the witness. He's a 16-year-old African-American kid who, I think I mentioned him earlier, can't get, went down to see the, the president uh, from the, the, everyone got let out of school if they said they were gonna go see the president. And he is the one who saw the bald spot. Uh, so the, the, the prosecution is not gonna call him because he can't identify anything but a bald spot. Uh, but uh, the bald spot ties in with Sylvia Odio and, it's, and the defense is gonna be presented. And so uh, he says to Karen, 
I want you to go and see the mom and dad. And uh, we got an all white jury and they had desegregated the public seating because people were coming from all over the world and the city fathers knew it would look terrible if now the jury the jury pool had already been had already was already fixed and it was by tradition all white so they can't do anything about the jury but they could do something about the public seating so so he didn't like the idea that Amos Ewens would be sitting on the stand and there would be his mom and the traditionally white part of the gallery. Think about how awful that is that we don't have that problem today, but in that era, that would have been a big problem. And he's, he, because he, he says to Karen, somebody on that jury is gonna resent it. And we, we are talking about our only chance is a holdout. We need one person to hold out talking about the death penalty. So I want you to go to, talking to Karen, I want you to go to see the parents and try to talk them into not coming on the day Amos testifies. Now think about that for a minute. I think this is one of the better scenes in the story. She says, uh, I can't do that. He says, you're asking me to tell them not to come and it, solely on account of their race. He says, that's right, solely on account of their race. That's the whole point. She says, I can't do that. So finally he says, okay, I'll drive out there and I'll do it myself. So a couple of days go by and eventually the time comes that uh, Percy drives out uh, under the ostensible reason just to make sure that Amos knows where the courthouse is and, and uh, he'd make sure to do as all lawyers would do to say, tell the truth. By the way, you young lawyers, when you interview a witness <laughs> at the end, you say, tell the truth. Now, I always make sure you do that. So he says that, and uh, and and he's about to, 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 she says to, well, we, it's very hard to get a seat, uh, and we were hoping you could help us get a seat. That would have been true. There would have been very little public seating, and in the story, they're reserving a few seats for the public each day. And he says, well, I'll see what I can do about it. Well, thinking at the time that he's just going to tell her he can't get a seat. And she suspects that that's what the answer is going to be. But uh, on the way back to the hotel, uh, even a tough guy like Percy Foreman is uh, overcome by a feeling of what uh, the Ewans had been able to do despite great obstacles. And uh, he, he decides that, he, that Karen was right. And he calls uh, Robert Oswald, who's the brother of Lee Harvey Oswald, and he says to, uh, could, could you give up your seat for about 30 minutes for a witness? And Robert says, of course. So he then calls Mrs. He went back and says, okay, we have a seat for you. And, uh, and then he pours himself another drink in the hotel room saying, somehow we'll muddle through this. <coughs> now, any of you who've ever been a trial lawyer, I, that, that scene is a pretty dramatic scene. And I would say uh, most lawyers don't have one that dramatic. But we, as a trial lawyer, you do have some scenes where you have tough issues like that. And you get to the end of the day and you say, I don't know, somehow we will muddle through. And you pour yourself another drink and go to bed. <laughs> uh, being a trial lawyer is a hard, hard job. So I try to portray that. I think it's a good scene. Mm -hmm. I think it's a good scene. And 
Well, yeah, I mean, true to that era. <clears throat> true to that era. My last comment will be before we open this up for questions from the audience is one of the things I really enjoyed about this, and I'm speaking to our future lawyers as, uh, here, is the civility between the council that you built into this story. They all on both sides respected each other and treated each other with civility and were appropriate in court and no, you know, like little digs at each other and those kind of things. They were advocates for their side zealous advocates, but they respected each other. And for me, that contrast with Jack Ruby's trial, where I really got the sense that Henry Wade and Alexander and Melvin Belli and Joe Tyner, they just didn't like each other. And that came across in what was presented and even how they related to the court. So thank you for that. And lesson on civilities future law students. <laughs> Judges like to see that, don't they, Your Honor? Can I comment on that? Uh, it's not only we like to see that, but I, what I wanted to add several agendas here, but uh, one was to show the best defense against the best offense uh, based on true facts, not based on wild conspiracy theories, but based on what's in the Warren Commission reports and evidence. But another, another, and another one was to have a, a courtroom thriller. It's a, I, I think the, the scenes of the uh, cross-examination of, and the, the direct and the cross of Lee Harvey Oswald, that's, that's what we never got to hear. But this is, I think it's, it's good. I think it's good. I, so I wanted a courtroom thriller. But I also wanted to teach the public how good lawyers, and I mean good lawyers, the top 10%, how good lawyers try cases and prepare cases. Yeah, it's easy to be a nasty lawyer, uh, flamboyant, but that is not what good lawyers will do. I've seen plenty of good, good lawyers. I've seen plenty of the bad lawyers. The good lawyers perform the way that uh, the lawyers perform in this book. So that is the plug for the book, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Get that and read about the cross-examinations. High point in my view as well. At this time, we're going to open this up for questions from the audience, and we have pieces of paper somewhere back there for you to write your question upon and bring it up. Uh, we have someone set that's ready to do that, and we will address those questions. Can, while they're doing that, can I collect a question? Can I read one section? Oh. By all means. Okay, I'm gonna, I want to read, uh, this is not going to give away the ending, <laughs> but uh, can I read to you uh, 90 seconds? Uh, and it's a, this, the scene is uh, Abe, who is the, the lead pr protagonist, and Elaine, who is the uh, his, uh, a, a federal assistant, uh, and they're in the middle of the trial, and there is, and they, she invited him over to get some uh, bacon and grits at her for breakfast, and now she's driving <coughs> him back into town. Uh, and uh, all of this is on a, there's no romance. I, I, I decided I was not a romance writer, so <laughs> there's no romance in this book. Uh, uh, that's, uh, so, but nevertheless, they become friends. And uh, so this is a scene where she's driving him back into town uh, and she, by the way, is slightly prone to conspiracy theories, and Abe is not. Okay, so here we go. Time came to drive Abe back into town. This is from uh, uh, Oak Cliff. Rain, time came to drive Abe back into town. Rain now swept the landscape. They made a dash for the Volkswagen bug. Soon its wipers slapped simple time. Elaine studied the roadway as sheets of rain swept by. She, she's the one that's driving. All this conspiracy talk in the newspapers, a broker concentration, is based on a refusal to accept coincidence for what it is. There is a world of difference, he continued, between random coincidence versus cause and effect. Take you and Karen, both of you are friends and own this case but it's just a coincidence. One didn't cause the other. They drove over the Houston Street Viaduct toward downtown. The Hertz clock on top of the depository glowed 
through the mist. A better example, he developed a rhythm. Oswald is on the sixth floor of the jail. Wade's on the sixth floor of the records building next door. The sniper's next nest was on the sixth floor of the building catty corner to Wade. A conspiracy of sixes, right? All three buildings loomed before them. She laughed. No, answered, and Abe answered himself in a quiet voice. No, 6,000 times. No, it's just a coincidence. Just coincidence. <clears throat> Elaine, there are two types of people. One type accepts coincidence for what it is. The other sees it as evidence of something ominous, usually conspiracy. Rainwater poured out of Dealey Plaza. The scene of the crime was drenched, but the little car blew big heat. There will always be, he continued, people who insist on biblical certitude as the standard of proof, usually the conspiracy types. On Oswald, the proof is overwhelming. 95 out of 100 will say, fry the bastard, but five will see in the very same evidence the hand of a mastermind conspiracist and say that he was just a patsy. No amount of proof short of biblical certitude would satisfy them. They're willing ears for any conspiracy theory. Elaine pressed her lips. Thing is, she replied, Percy only needs one holdout for a hung jury. Does five out of a hundred boil down to one out of twelve? Not if we picked our jury right, he said with confidence. And I think he and I think we did. I like that phrase, she teased, biblical certitude. <laughs> All right. Okay, okay, we have questions? You have a question? We have one. Uh, what is your opinion of the second shooter on the knoll at the Plaza? Uh, there was no second shooter on Dealey Plaza, uh, is my opinion. Now, let me say what the, the there is some evidence that, uh, that in the book that is treated. So, it, uh, uh, it, the puff of smoke. Uh, and Sam Holland, who saw a puff of smoke over in the direction of the, of the stockade fence, uh, that is one of the, I'll, to be, I'll say, uh, mysteries. And I have no doubt that he saw something. But what he, the way he described it, he himself said it was not a, uh, it didn't sound like a gunshot, it sounded like a firecracker. And that's what I think actually it probably was if, if it was anything. And, but it was not a, it was not a fire shot. They, they have never found any evidence of any bullet or ejected shell or anything coming from that direction that to be a, a second shooter. So this is just my opinion, but I've spent 50 years evaluating evidence and trying to size up a case. And I think that thing with the second shooter is, they, they rushed up there right away. They saw no one. They rushed up there, they, that big parking lot, they would have seen somebody leaving. Uh, in the few seconds it took to, to get up there and look over the fence. So in my view, there was no one up there and uh, we will never know exactly what Sam Holland saw as the puff of smoke. So that's my, uh, that's my view of that one. Okay. Is the evidence in the book for the defense actual evidence from the Warren Commission report? In other words, did you make up any defense evidence for your novel? None. It's all it's all in, right there in the Warren Commission report, and uh, that's the thing that surprised me that no one has seen this line of defense in all the uh, internet conspiracy theory types. I went on to see if anyone had ever even seen this connection of the bald spot. You know, two witnesses saying bald spot. No, you'd go when you go home tonight. Look it up. See if you can find it. Let me know if you find. It. I looked many times over several years. I could not find anyone who had ever drawn the, uh, seen this connection uh, before. But every single thing that is used as a defense in this story is right there in the Warren Commission report. How do you think the evidence would hold up under the deliberations of a modern and more diverse jury as compared to the jury of that time, especially given the suspicions, experiences that many have have had with the police or believe about the police? It, 
it, uh, well, that's where jury selection and the chapter I had to omit uh, <laughs> become very important. And uh, you know, in those, in those days and still today, in a death penalty case, you bring in one juror at a time, and sometimes it takes all day. You can go three days for diarying a, a, a particular potential uh, juror. Uh, that's why it takes so long. Uh, I'm going to say I'm going to say he he would be found guilty today with with a uh, modern jury. If uh, and you would have to weed out the uh, people who are conspiracy types, and that would be perfectly legal. That's nothing wrong with that. In my experience. You know, what was that, something about racial diversity? Mm -hmm. In my experience, the, 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 uh, the black people on the juries and white people, Hispanics, uh, Asians, they tend to see the evidence the same way. I don't, I don't think there is a uh, new cult that would say, oh, I belong to a certain race, oh, I hate the cops. Oh, therefore, I'm going to vote to acquit. I mean, there are a few people like, but those people can legitimately be excluded from jury serving on a jury. Uh, most people of all races, and I picked a lot of juries, are not are not uh, are not against the police, and they're not necessarily for them either. But they they understand that we need police in order to have a civilized society and that most police officers are very honorable and they do, you know, they do their job and it's the, it's the occasional bad guy that we hear about that, that gives them a, it's a bad apple problem. Uh, so that's my, uh, that's my answer to that one. Okay. Well, our last question is, I have something near and dear to my heart, military service. But do you think that Oswald's military service and I don't know whether I should claim that or not, but he was a Marine and so was I. <laughs> I don't know if I like that connection. But do you think that Oswald's military service would have been a large highlight considering the war tension? Well, you were probably honorably discharged. Yes. Oh, my honor. He was the best president of <laughs> uh, 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 They changed it uh, whenever he... Uh, they changed it to undesirable. Uh, uh, he was uh, he was not he was in the stockade a lot. He was not, a, a, but he did qualify once. There were three levels of marksmanship: marksman, sharpshooter, and like expert, expert, expert. And he qualified two times: once as the lower level, once as the middle level, but not never at the top level. Uh, and so I do think his military training helped him understand how to fire a rifle and load a rifle and to aim a rifle and, and, and to be proficient at it. So yeah, I do think, I mean, I don't see how, so certainly that helped. Uh, but that's the only way that I can see that his military service uh, played a role. Okay. Well. But that's an important role. Most people, have no clue how to load a rifle. And so they, maybe in Texas, uh, <laughs> but, but uh, by the way, I, I, I got a rifle myself, a 22 from when I was a kid. I don't have anything against rifles. But uh, I, uh, I, 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 I say most people these days, not so much those days, but most people these days could not tell a, could not figure out how to load and aim a rifle. They'd be afraid of the thing. Mm. Don't you think that's right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah, but the, the Karanko rifle is loaded top load before you fire the first round. I think it held like six <coughs> rounds. Uh, well, wasn't there a clip in it? That I think it had a clip of four. Uh, four, uh, uh -oh. the, uh, the the, the one, you're talking about the one Oswald had? Yes. Yeah, I think it, it, had, it had a clip with four uh, bullets. Uh, and uh, three were shot and one was left in there. 
So, but I thought the, the clip came up from the, the bottom. Yeah. I don't know. I'm pretty sure of that. I, I thought where, where, where's Stephen? Stephen would know. Is that it, right? It was, yeah. It's a Mauser action, and I thought all the Mausers loaded from the top, because that's mm. just no, uh, been Stephen, a what's the answer to that? It's no, loaded from the bottom. It's loaded from the bottom. Yeah, okay. And with her car common. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your questions, and thank you, Judge, for uh, talking about your book, which is still available out there, I believe. <laughs> and now we have Nicola Langford, who's going Longford. to Longford. Yes, I'm the CEO of the Six Four Museum, Dilly Pals, and I want to thank all of you for being here tonight. I especially want to thank Dean Epps for the excellent job leading this event's discussion, and I'd like to thank President Mong who's also on the museum board. And I especially want to thank Judge Alsop for making the journey all the way from San Francisco and telling us such a compelling story and what inspired you to write this uh, fascinating novel. And do stay tuned for our next set of programs that are coming down the way this year. This is the 60th anniversary of um, President Kennedy's assassination here in Texas. So this historic site and the one down the street at the Sixth Form Museum are very important places to visit. So I hope that you will still be our friends and stay on our journey through the next several months. Thank you very much. I want to be the first to get my book on so I want to stay on the story and what inspired you to write this uh, fascinating novel.